Good morning to all. And I think the course or the program this morning is one that says, uh, know your taxes. But I rather ask the question, do you know your taxes? Because what you don't know, what you don't understand creates fear, creates doubt, creates concern, creates anxiety. What you do know, based on information, based on knowledge, will help you all to better appreciate how to run your business and how to, in some ways, minimize your tax exposure. So I welcome you this morning to this session on taxes. I know for some it may be challenging in terms of all the language and stuff, so I'll take my time to explain. Please feel free to enter into the chat any questions you may have. I may choose to answer the question as, as, I, as I go along, or we may leave those questions depending on what they are to the end, and we wrap it up nicely at the end with, a, with some questions. Um, at some point, just around 10, 10, 30 or thereabouts, we would have a morning break. And just around 12 o'clock, between 12 and 12, uh, 30, we'll have another break then. Um, it might be a long one, and we'll try to finish as early as we possibly can to get you back to what you're doing. Um, in a normal classroom, we will meet and greet and chat. And um, But in this space, we are slightly different. So the chat is where going to, I'm seeing you all. And I hope that in that conversation space, we can um, really expand on the knowledge that you need to have to appreciate your business as well. So I see I have just about 17 or so of you now and probably perhaps more coming in a bit later. But let's get going in terms of who I am. Um, I run my own small and micro enterprise business and I try to help small and micro enterprise persons um, get their business right and do what they do. At the end of these slides, you will have my um, Facebook page, website. Um, you'll get uh, my phone number and email address. Feel free to ask your questions, communicate, and I will try my best to assist you as we go along. For many of you, and you're not unique in this regard, we have a view of taxes. For some of us, that view is one where we feel that the tax man is yet to shake the money out of us. Whatever money we have, he wants to take some of it and, and get some of it for his purpose. And that might be so from the point of view that for whatever you make, there's a tax exposure that you will have to pay something back to the government with regard to taxes in many different forms, um, direct or indirect taxes, so to speak. Taxes that we directly know that we're going to have to pay and indirectly when some things come to you, but you're not necessarily seeing how the taxes are being taken out from it. And then there are those of us who have a different perspective totally on taxes, totally different. They're just crazy. They don't want to hear anything about it. It's a madness. I want to avoid it. I don't want to hear anything about it. And I don't want to do anything about it. Let me from the beginning say to all of you, it is based on information that you have that the fear of taxes will disappear. It is based on the information you have. And the more information you have, the more you will appreciate that there is no fear in what this thing called taxes would be all about. I hope at the end of today, I will put you in a more comfortable position as business persons, entrepreneurs, to be able to treat with your taxes effectively and to put yourself in a place where you minimize your tax exposure. And I want to underline that. I want to underline the word minimize your tax exposure. The issue here is that you can, you ought not to avoid, you ought not to avoid taxes because that could lead to penalties and charges. What you would want to do is in some way evade, but evade it from the point of view that you use the tax laws to your benefit. And by so doing, you will find yourself in a more efficient tax position and in some ways pays much less taxes than you ought to have paid. Let me bring you up to date with what's happening though, with what's going on. Today in the Guardian newspaper this morning, there's an article on page five from Senator saying 
go after tax evading parasites. That may be some of us, yeah? be careful. And what is he saying? He said, make, make them pay. He's saying to make people pay. Illegal operators, go after them. Make them pay. This happened in the Senate this week. Go on. And the senator's making that comment. He further went on to indicate that when we don't we don't like taxes, but the government sees taxes as a way of funding its operations. And for many of us, quite recently, we began to appreciate what the government is there for, simply because as a result of what is going on today. The government is now giving what we call grants to individuals at different levels. And for many of us, we want to access those grants. But the trick in the accessing the grant is in the documentation that you are filling in. As a business person, you may find yourself exposed if you weren't doing the right things before. These documents are going to the National Insurance Board, they're going to the Ministry of Social Development. It is one government, and therefore they are. They are uh, avenues and opportunities where the tax man now will probably step in or the compliance officers of the National Insurance Board to ensure that you are doing the right thing. The Paul Richards said, due to the pandemic in Trinidad and Tobago, the system of taxes needs to be updated. And that's true. That's very true. It is going to be updated. The Senate had a debate on the revenue authority of Trinidad and Tobago with the hope and aim of bringing into place the revenue authority. The systems and processes for the authority does exist today. The authority has, the, the, the Board of Indian Revenue has line of sight as to what the persons who are paying taxes, VAT, and all other form of taxes across the entire spectrum. They can see it in an instant. They can pull up your records in an instant. Um, the system works. But our version of the taxes needs to change. And we need to appreciate that it's for the collective benefit of the society that we're in and for a better future for ourselves and our country as a whole. So I hope at the end of this program today, that you find yourself in a place where you better appreciate taxes, how to treat with them, how to manage them, and in some way, how to at least be able to access those things that you need to access without fear nor worry with regard to the fact of whether or not you're compliant or not, because you would be compliant because you understand what needs to be done with your business. So we start today by talking to you and saying to you, let's know your taxes, let's understand taxes. And, and, and I just wanna throw some questions to you. Very simple questions. Some of you may know the answer, some of you might not know the answer. And it is not a quiz for Mark, so don't worry, don't pass or fail in this. But I wanna start begin to appreciate. If you have the answer to the question, then you have no problem. If you have the answer to the problem to the question and therefore as a, a pensioners required to pay income taxes true or false a pensioners required to pay income taxes a pensioner is someone who either accesses national insurance pension at some point in time in their life or uh, you come to retirement age and the answer is yes it's very simple and clear the answer is yes they are required to pay their taxes they are required to pay taxes. If you are a pensioner, you're required to pay income taxes based on the income that you receive in excess of your personal allowance. Not because you have reached retirement age, you have, you have to ignore the people's taxes. That is a problem. And worse yet, if you're a pensioner who happens to be on pension but working otherwise or working beyond your pensionable age, you're getting pension payment and you're getting other benefits, then you have to combine both of them to determine your tax exposure to the Board of Inland Revenue. 
The next question. How much do we really know about taxes from the point of view in general? How long should records be kept for your business or for your personal uh, records? How long should we keep our records, both in terms of our business and our personal? Is it one year, five years, seven years, 10 years? How long should we keep it? Because we use it to we use our records to determine our, our taxes and stuff like that. And clearly, you know, you need to be killer. So it's really, it is six plus one, which equals seven. It is the six years, the current year, plus six years before, so that the Board of Interim Revenue can go back to 2014 and um, ask you to provide the relevant information to them with regard to your business or your personal. Beyond that period, they, seem, they tend to ignore. So you either do two things, you either comply or you hope and live that they will, that time will relapse and they might, you might forget. What's the next question? As a self-employed person, as many of you are, what taxes would be applicable to you all? Income tax, health surcharge, VAT, or all of the above? What taxes would you have to pay? And yes, click on the draw, some of us, and the answer is in fact D. All these taxes, all these taxes, you all as entrepreneurs and business persons need to understand and appreciate how these taxes impact your business. Very, very simple. You must know that. And you must see how they impact you and how you will treat and calculate with them for the purposes of your business. Upon conviction, the maximum penalty for non-compliance would be what? Imprisonment, fine, or fine and imprisonment? And the answer to that is yes, it's a C, because we, we, you can be fined and you can go to a prison. Now, if that doesn't scare you, what, you know, it's not about scaring. The issue is, and I mean, when we look at what's happening in Trinidad, you don't hear much of it. There are some cases that do go to the, the um, tax appeal board and end up in certain quarters, and you don't, that's much, not much publicized, you don't hear it, but it happens. People are penalized and they have to pay fines and they, they do have to go. Um, you would appreciate that when you, in some jurisdictions, and this is what Paul Richards and, and, and Senator Vero were in the, would have been indicating, that we go after people through taxes. They want the tax system revised, but they want us to, they want more compliance by people and therefore they would need people to be go, they need to go after those who are trying to um, evade the taxes, um, avoid the taxes in some way. That's what they're trying to do. So that with the revenue authority coming into play at some time in the near future, it is incumbent upon all of you as business persons, entrepreneurs, to make sure that your business records are in order and to make sure that you are tax compliant so that you do not find yourself exposed in other ways to penalties and fines at a later date. So let's see what we're gonna to do today. Let's see what we're gonna try and understand. We will try and understand the whole issue of income taxes and corporation taxes. Now, income taxes speak to those of us who are sole traders. Someone asked the question, can we go back to the first question? How can you pay income taxes when you don't make an income? <laughs> if you don't make an income and you're not employed, if you're not employed, well, then you're not paying income taxes. If your business is not running, it's not trading, you don't have to pay taxes. You're paying income taxes as a pensioner because a pensioner is gaining income. And if his income is at a certain level, he could be a pensioner and working otherwise still, he has to pay or to pay taxes. He's getting, he's getting his pension at a level above um, that of the allowance, 
he will pay taxes because the persons who are paying him his pension ought to deduct taxes for him. A pension is not free money. Yeah, thank you very much. So you want to look at income taxes and how it affects, particularly those of you who are sole traders and your, in your personal capacity. Um, I'm, some of you might not be corporations, but that's still for your own awareness. And for those of you who, who may at some point in time migrate to the issue of a, a, a corporation, then it's important for you to consider and understand. So that knowledge would also be exposed today. And in the sense that from a corporation point of view, we will do a little bit of work on that, not to scare you, but to show you that again, it's a simple way of understanding. We will also look at the issue of we also look at the issue of looking at how BR numbers and for sole traders and partnerships are organized and how people will treat with them and how you need to appreciate and understand them as you go along. And then the last thing that we look at is this whole issue of proper record keeping. Um, there's a special program for that, a separate program for that, but it's important in this context that we um, look at record keeping because your requirements that the Board of Indian Revenue has that you need to comply with in terms of your record keeping. The question has been asked, what about a landlord and his rent? You also have to pay taxes on your rent. If you are, if you are getting a rent, let's say you're getting a rent of $5,000 or $3,000 per month, you're still liable to taxes on your rental income. Um, some people in Trinidad don't, some landlords might not do that, but you bet your bottom dollar, you hear what the prime minister has been indicating, landlords, please go easy, <laughs> right? And I'm sure at some point in time, they will look, be looking at the owners of a property and what taxes they are paying. As we, as we go forward in terms of the revenue authority, every tax element would be subject to scrutiny, would be subject to review, would be subject to understanding and compliance. So don't mind where the income is earned from, you must understand your tax exposure to that income. And the last one that we will talk about today is the issue of value added tax. For some of you, um, you have a threshold to, to arrive at before you can start even contemplating value added tax. And therefore we'll talk about that. We will look at how it is calculated. And at the end of it, uh, once you appreciate how these things are done, you ought not to be fearful of doing it or getting someone to do it for you in a professional way. So what is our purpose today? What is this thing called? Taxes. Taxes for us, many of us, is really a fee or levied by a corporation or an individual that is enforced by a level of government in order to finance government activity. That's what taxes are about. Property tax, we, we know of property tax that is languishing there in parliament as to when they will implement it. They need revenue in order for the business of local government to run. That's how they gather their revenue. The country needs revenue in order to run the country's business. Understand carefully. Yes, we're in a lockdown situation, but understand the businesses and the organizations that have been kept open to make things at least appear to be running and at least something is happening. And one of the most important things that was, was kept open was the Board of Inland Revenue and the National Insurance. Why? Because they want money to come in in order to do the things that they need to do. They have a lot of money to spend now. So that individuals and businesses are required by law to pay various forms of taxes, while at the same time um, pay income tax, pay their health surcharge on the income that they receive. If you don't have an income, you have no tax exposure. If you have an income, you have a tax exposure. And therefore, the purpose for us today is to understand what taxes we are exposed to, how they are calculated, how they are paid in every respect. 
So there are different procedures as to how taxes are paid, depending on whether you, that you're the payee or an individual or a business. So depending on who you are, where you stand, will be determined how you handle how this thing of tax payments are concerned. In your own right, as an individual, you have a tax liability based on your employment, uh, where you work. As a business person, you also have a tax exposure from the point of view of your business and yourself as a sole trader, or if you're a limited liability from company from a point of view of a limited liability. In order to understand, therefore, in order to understand how these taxes affect your business, we need to look at the types of business registrations that exist in order for us to appreciate what, how your taxes affect you. We want to understand the type of business registrations that exist. The business registrations that exist either exist in a profit-making enterprise or what we call a non-profit-making enterprise. You have sole traders, partnerships, and companies in a profit-making enterprise. You have a non-profit-making enterprise called charities, what was at the NGO or CBO, a non-governmental organization or community-based organization a faith-based organization, a cooperative or friendly society. Those are non-profit. But I want to caution you, not because an organization says it is not for profit. It means that the money that we're making, we're not taxing. In order for you to get tax exemptions, you have to be a registered charity of some sort or the organization that you have gets a tax exemption for some particular reason. So depending on the type of organization you are, be it a sole trader, partnership, or company, you are profit-making and you are in a zone of taxes. If I assume today that many of you present are sole traders or partnerships, I will focus in some way will go beyond that to ensure that you fully understand. I will touch on companies so that some, it might be that one of you or many of you might be already incorporated or my, those of you who intend to go to a corporate level at some point, so you get the appreciation of it today as to what the tax positions would be. I will touch a little bit about charities and nonprofit organizations because some of you might be doing your trade and working within, within um, nonprofit organizations and we'll talk a little bit about that. So you have also an appreciation of how that works. So sole traders, many of you are sole traders and therefore in the simplest form, it's the simplest form of organization and the key to this though is that there's that your liability is unlimited your liability is unlimited meaning that you are exposed for the debts that you have incurred and therefore anybody can, any person who you owe can go after you in your personal capacity and go after your personal assets your assets and yourself are pretty much the same. The financial statements though for a sole trader are very simple, not complicated. And you will find that all of you in the business that you're in, as I was saying in, other, in the other programs, must on a monthly basis be aware of the income that you make in its total amount and the expenditure that you have made in its totality. You must, as a business person, sit down and at least be able to have a simple statement of income and expenditure. The accountants have different ways to look at these income and expenditure statements. And as you begin to practice doing it, you would learn the different things that you need to do to improve the content of your financial statement. A sole trader registration, to go and register a sole trader is 20, that's about $20 to get the name approved. Uh, once the name has been approved, you go out and you pay, you get you pay the relevant reg registration fee of $240. And those two, that total amount will give you what you need to do to get your business registration done. If you are sitting down in this program today and you're not yet registered as a business, then I would advise that you do so as soon as you can. I will talk a little bit about that in the end. Um, 
we will want to make sure that all of you you are you are accessing government funding you're doing business with the government of Trinidad and Tobago be a registered business you want to talk to your bankers to raise money to do your business you want to, to avoid commingling of funds between your business and yourself the banker will want to know that you are in business and you have to prove so by your registration documentation all right the cost of registration you first have to do the name search. I just want to go back over based on the question asked. The name search, uh, it's $20. And that $20 will get you the name approval. After the name approval, you then submit the registration form. And with the registration form, you pay your 240 and you get your business registration certificate. With regard to the question raised with regard to, is there a tax break for persons who provide housing for over 25 persons or employ over 500 <laughs> employees. Um, we will get to that in a different way. There are, there, are different, there are different tax benefits for certain things. And uh, we will get to that as we go through the latter part of it. Uh, I will want to get into more detail as to what you're asking. And maybe later in the, um, in the submission, um, we will then get into those kinds of what tax breaks or tax benefits that you have and you can access based on the type of businesses that you are running. Um, so a sole trader is the simplest way to go. And I'm asking you all of you, if you are not registered today, then go get yourself registered. It's a very simple process. If you can't do it yourself, get somebody to do it for you and try and get it done. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I'm saying this. The grant that is being given today with regard to self-employed persons you're self-employed are you registered a self-employed business all of that all of that information is going to go on a form so the taxi driver is not registered says he's a taxi driver he's going by his name and he wants to claim he will be challenged in terms of are you registered and uh, did you file your taxes and did you do this and did you do that all of those things will come to bear on the decision making of the award of the grant. With regard to the other form of business, and that is partnership. A partnership is where two or more persons get together in a relationship for the business. Now, there's advantages to doing this, and of course there are disadvantages. All I would advise from the get-go, if you are in partnership with somebody, document an agreement as to how the partnership is going to run if you can get an agreement with your partner as to how we'd run this business do it before you start to register there's an advantage of course of having a partnership it is easy to form all the registrations that you have will be done at the board of uh, the company's registry very simple to do so it's don't find don't get it don't make it a, you go to the counter they will help you or you talk to someone who's familiar with doing this kind of work and they will help you so do not um avoid doing this there are limited rules and regulations for partnerships uh why i come together as a partnership is because i'm either to get capital or have some expertise and we can come together um you might be a designer and you might be an engineer and we come together and do construction because you can handle you know we have two persons with different expertise that can come together and do work in a partnership though you all pay income tax in the partnership we you all will pay income tax and we'll discuss that in more detail because there's a slight quirk in how we treat with partnership income tax so it's good to be a partnership because you can somebody can be helpful but my advice would be put an agreement in place because when money starts to flow in a business then people's relationships and attitudes can change and people might become forgetful too so you want to be sure from the get-go there is an agreement as to how we'll operate there are disadvantages to this thing called a, a partnership because it has a limited life limited life from the point of view that if if any one of the partners pass on then the partnership is dissolved if any one of the partners pass on, the business that business is done. The partnership has unlimited liability. So just like a sole trader, the partnership 
has unlimited liability. So both the partners or all of the partners will find themselves exposed to any liabilities that are caused by the business that they're in. And therefore, your personal assets uh, can be affected. Then you have, of course, the mutual agency, meaning that you and your partner act in harmony with, well, I won't say harmony, but act for each other. And therefore, the things that someone does in the partnership, one partner is doing, will also implicate the partner who didn't do it because both of you have a mutual agency arrangement where each of you are acting on behalf of the partnership. So you have to be careful of that and you have to be understanding that before you get into the partnership, please have some kind of agreement as to how we share profits, how we raise capital, how we do things, and what are the limitations of the authority of the various partners to do what they need to do. So let's look at this whole issue of taxation and tax to sole traders and partnerships. Sole traders and partnerships fall under the Income Tax Act, Chapter 7501. That's the basic reference you can find. In the case of sole traders, the BR registration number, the BR registration number of the owner of the business is the same number as the individual so the same number you have in your personal capacity as a sole trader is the same number that you'll have for your sole trader business you're filing taxes under your name basically now i just want to indicate for those of you who are not employed but you are entrepreneurs in, in your right and you have registered your business getting your br number is a simple process get your business registration certificate from the company's registry that you've paid for, your forms of ID, uh, your, you, your proof of address. There's a form to be filled out, which we'll discuss later today, and you take it into the Board of Inland Revenue, and they'll provide you with your personal tax number. As a sole trader, that number is the number for yourself and for your business. Taxes in this business would be assessed on the total income of the sole trader, or the individuals involved in the partnership. I repeat that. Taxes on total income for the sole trader or on the individuals in the partnership. So the partnership income, based on the profit sharing arrangements of the partnership, each of the partners will be taxed in accordance with their share of the profits coming out of the partnership. So as a sole trader or partnership, you'll be taxed based on the income that you have received in your personal capacity. With regard to companies now, companies though create what I call as a separate veil of incorporation, meaning that when you are incorporated as a company, you and the company are separated. A company in its own right, a company in its own right um, has its own liability, has its own exposure. If you go to register a company, you have to have your company secretary, you have to have your directors, you have to have the BR numbers for the company. There's an advantage of doing this thing called a company because lab, liability, liability is limited, and therefore the, you as an individual will not be exposed to the liabilities of the company. As a company, I can raise capital privately or publicly uh, for the running of the business. I can transfer ownership. I can pass on ownership to someone else. I can employ professional management to work for the business. And of course, there's continuous existence of the business as a company. The difficulty here though is the company has more regulations and more exposure. If you fail to file certain requirements of a company today, it will cost you $300 per month for every month you fail to file, compounded. So that if you fail to file in the first 12 months, that's $3,600. And by the next year, that could multiply rapidly. And you find yourself within two to three years, you will can owe $20,000 $30, quite comfortably because of the compounded nature of the penalties. Only step into company organization once you have a full appreciation of what your exposures are likely to be. 
of course, there's a disadvantage of being in a company. There are tax disadvantages, there are increased regulations, there are things that you have to do. The company has to make sure that it has minutes and records. The company has to make sure it pays its taxes and complies with other statutory responsibilities. The company has to ensure that it, it files its beneficial ownership in a timely manner. There are things that the company needs to do. There is a separation of ownership and control. The owners are separated from apart from the managers. Those who own shares are not operating in the business, don't necessarily have that control that they're looking for. You can't be a shareholder on the outside and want to call shots on the inside. So that there's that disadvantage that is presented to you. I also, which, which, I, which I didn't list here, I want to also indicate that although companies provide what we call a veil of incorporation, the veil can easily be lifted because today banks, when you go to the banks and you sign for loans, the banks will ask you to, to um to provide some kind of surety or surety on the loan and by doing so the whole veil is shifted because you take on the responsibilities you take on the, the exposure if the company fails then they can come after you but if they didn't do that then they can only if anything happens they can only go after the company they don't have to go after you in your personal capacity I will deal with employees and, and that relationship. Now, I will say this here much that from a company point of view, um, some of you are not there. Some of you may eventually go there, but it's not that difficult. I will deal with the issue of, from a question coming about we got to TD4s and sole traders and stuff. I will deal with that down the road in more detail. So I will save that quest, this question for later on. So, if I'm a company or corporation, I refer to as limited liability. The limited liability company, therefore corporations are subject to corporation tax, not, not income tax. You as a sole trader, you as a partnership are subject to income tax. But as a corporation, you are subject to corporation tax under the Corporation Tax Act 7502. Um, with regard to this company, the company will be issued with a BR number. It's registered, it must register for PAYE. It must register for VAT if it, if it qualifies for VAT. It must register for VAT if it qualifies. I want to say this just for a minute. Many persons do companies and then jump in to say to themselves, I need to get VAT registered. The, the Board of Inland Revenue will not allow you to be VAT registered. Well, I don't say not allow, because sometimes it, it could happen. But the Board of Revenue Revenue will rather you make the qualified income in order to be VAT registered, and that is five hundred thousand dollars before you can be VAT registered. We'll talk a bit more detail about that. A question is posed here: Isn't there a separate filing form for business sole traders with a separate section? There is a there's one tax return form which is an expanded tax return form for business persons. But it's this, if if you look at it carefully. The form that you file for tax purposes, and I'll be showing to you later on in the presentation. The form as an individual is a one page form on either side. The form for a sole trader business is the same form with another 14 pages attached to that, so that the, the business documentation and supporting documents with income from the business is first put together and then come, comes into the first page in addition to your personal earnings. And your business earnings to derive your tax liability and exposure. I trust that would answer your question. So back to corporations. Taxes are assessed on the revenues and profits generated by the corporation. Taxes are assessed on the revenue or profit by the corporation. The corporation does not pay health surcharge. The corporation does not pay health surcharge. Sole traders, those of you who are sole traders and not employed, and Peter, I want to do it slowly. If you are a sole trader and not employed, you ought to be paying health surcharge. And we'll talk about that in a little while. The next entity that we have to look at is this whole issue of nonprofit organizations. So to register a charitable organization, or company or foundation, 
you must be operating for this one year. You must be operating for this one year. The organization must submit a letter requesting charitable status to the Permanent Secretary Ministry of Finance with relevant attachments and supporting documentation, your financial records, your constitution, and a number of other um, information as to why you should be given charitable status. The application is forwarded to the Office of His Excellency the President, and based on a recommendation from the Ministry of Finance, then the president will approve. Once the charitable status is approved by the by His Excellency or Her Excellency, the organization must become um, exempt for paying some taxes. Once you have charitable status, if you if you're a nonprofit organization and you do not have charitable status, you can be subject to tax exposure. So, for those of you who are in those types of organizations, you need to be careful and look at what is happening because really and truly, if you have, to, if you're a nonprofit and you want to uh, allow yourself to be, ex not to be exposed to taxes, you need to get that charitable status uh, and by following the processes that are identified here. So we talked about sole traders. We talked about partnerships. It's the simplest form and I think it's the majority of you all. We talked a bit about corporations and some of you may aspire to become a corporation at some point. And of course, we talked about nonprofit organizations. All of us, all of them, all of them are subject to taxes, various types of taxes. And you want to be familiar and appreciate what those taxes are and how they work. So let's look at the type of taxes that we have. Hi, Wayne, if you don't mind me interjecting, I just have a question based on the previous slide that you just presented, right? Can I go ahead? Yes, please, of course. Um, um, this is the first time I'm hearing about the charitable status for um, NGOs in terms of when they're registered. I never heard of it before. Um, is there a time frame for you to to, to like um, apply for that? Yeah. Well, not, not a, it's not a limited time frame. You know, it's not yeah. a limited factor. You could be you, you form a charitable foundation. Yeah, yeah. You ought to be running for at least two years or a year. And yeah. have done your financial reports, uh -huh. and then go to get charitable status or apply for it. Oh, you okay. have an engagement with the Board of Inland Revenue, and you should be submitting these documents to the Board of Inland Revenue, just as a corporation would do or an individual would do in terms of submitting your documents. You are not for profit unless you are given the status to say so. A charitable organization, and we call myself, you cannot carry the status of charitable organization unless you are a registered charity by law. So you may need to look at the organization that you're talking about and see whether or not they meet these criteria. And if they, they don't have the relevant documentation, then there's a process to follow in order for you to get the charitable status. It takes a while and um, lots of questions have to be answered and a lot of documents provided. Understood. And so we'll do that. All right, with regard to the various taxes then, income tax is the first one and we are familiar income tax is on your personal income. In the case of sole traders and partnership individuals, the tax on you and your business income is one and the same, it's income tax. And therefore, as an individual, you are taxed on your income. So I am working, at Massey and I'm going home and I'm doing my sewing and design and I'm, I'm selling people clothes and buying trading and doing what I'm doing. It is the income of what you're getting at Massey and what you're getting at home comes together for your income tax purpose. Corporation tax is on the corporation that has been established. Now we get into some other taxes that, are, that, will, that you need to be also aware of. One of them is business levy and the other is green fund levy. We will talk in more detail about this shortly, but these two things that you all as sole traders need to be aware. And for the issue of health surcharge, that is also a kind of a tax that you also need to be aware of. There's of course value added tax. There are other taxes, and that depends on the type of business that you're in. You have hotel tax. 
hotels pay a separate tax line in, the, in their billing um, direct to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. There's petroleum tax for petroleum companies. Those who are extracting oil and gas pays a separate kind of tax. You have withholding tax. Individuals who are foreigners working in country and taxes are withheld from them. You have insurance tax, insurance companies. Uh, you, you're paying your, your car insurance and stuff and your house insurance. There's a tax element in there that, uh, uh, what you call it, companies, insurance companies pay a special tax which is deducted from you, um, from your payment, and they pay that insurance tax. Um, there was a tax on motor vehicle, but that um, had been suspended. Um, we, we now do it differently in terms of how they try to get extract from that, but there was also at one point in time a motor vehicle tax. And uh, so that this tax, tax would be levied on any income, any income, income tax, tax would be levied on any income of an individual arising out of the gains or profits arising from trade, business or profession or vocation. Any gains or profits arising from employment. So you see how they combine both. One and two is your business income and your personal income from your business at, at where you employ. Pension received, any pension received. All right. And any compensation, deferred payment in terms of an annuity or pension plan, compensation and compensation for loss of office, you have income tax exposure. Interest received, rent on property, royalties and dividends to some extent, not all, you have some tax exposure. All right. I want to, I want you to just settle on this for a minute to appreciate the span, the expanse of coverage of your exposure to tax liability. The income that you make from your business, the income you make from employment, the gains you have in terms of the work that you do, the pension that you're going to receive, the compensation for, for annuities and stuff like that, you are exposed to taxes. Some of us ignore it and we will pick it up and find it out at a later date. Income taxes payable on any income category above, any of them, doesn't matter. So that once you're in Trinidad and Tobago and you're a resident of Trinidad and Tobago, you're also elsewhere. This might be beyond the remit of this program, but I, this program, but I just want to indicate to you, once you are in a place in any country, you're exposed to tax liability. I trust you'll appreciate for many of you who have gone to the bank now and you depend on where you are and what you're doing and they're writing up these forms for FIU and whether or not you are tax exposed in the United States and stuff like that. All of those things and forms are where these, these information goes to, back to the relevant authorities to be able to track and see where tax exposures are likely to be. So once you have an exposure to tax, the taxman has one objective. He is going to collect it from you, right? Income tax is collected in two main ways. Income tax is collected in two main ways. The first way as employees is called PAYE. Income tax is deducted from your monument income of persons deemed to be employees. Such deductions are made at certain intervals, be it weekly or monthly, fortnightly, when you're paid and paid across to the Board of Inland Revenue. The other tax exposure you have, payment collection, is on a quarterly tax basis. Income tax. Income tax is paid directly to the Board of Inland Revenue Division at the 31st of March, 30th of June, 30th of September, 31st of December. On those quarterly days, other taxes are paid. Persons in receipt of income other than the monument income, it would require to utilize the quarterly payment arrangements. Let us explain a little bit. Um, you are employed working for my favorite food shop right now, Massey. 
and therefore Massey will take out PAYE for you because you're employed and they are paying you income and therefore they will take out their PAYE and they're responsible to pay to the board of inland revenue. But you are a designer of some sort and you're running your business and it's going well, you are required on the quarter days, which is March 31st, June 30th, September 30th and December 31st, to pay income tax and other taxes at that quarter date. Generally, you have to pay your business levy, your green fund levy, and your health surcharge on those quarter days. In addition, income that you've earned based on your calculations of the previous year, you will pay something contribution towards your taxes at that point in time. I repeat that because some people don't necessarily appreciate that. If you are making business income based on the previous year's income, you will pay some contribution to taxes on those quarterly days while you're paying your business levy and green fund levy. Why? Because you don't want to wait till the end of the year. The tax law says that you should be paying it on a quarterly basis, but you really don't want to wish to wait till the end of the year to pay a significant sum for the 12 months. So the tax um, law decides that yes, they will take it up for you on a quarterly basis. So you're paying income, business levy, green fund levy, income tax, health surcharge, quarterly. Are you all doing that? A question has been put with regard to, can you post pay the taxes that are constant? <laughs> Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? Uh, I'll take a pen to say to you, cash flow is king. Cash flow is king. Why do you want to post pay your taxes? For whose, well, for whose benefit really? It's better I have the cash in my hand than I use it. Right? You ought not to be doing that. If you do choose to do it, it's up to you, but that ought not to be done. Does your income have to be a certain amount to pay these things? We will talk that, we will show you that in a minute in terms of how we calculate the income and how we show the income. As a sole trader, um, again, I will show you that later on, but just suffice it to say now the question is coming People are looking, everyone looking, how can I avoid this? If I'm making, somebody said to me quite recently, oh, um, my business wasn't doing too much. I made about $4,000 last month. I had to pay tax. Yes, you do. If you qualify for tax exposure, you have to pay it. You have to pay your health surcharge quarterly. You have to, well, when, if, you, if you qualify, you have to pay the, the levies if you qualify. So the question is, you have to know your income, total income, and understand what your tax exposure is. And that's why in another program, we are saying to you, put in place the right records so that you have a monthly understanding of what income you're making. So for the three months ended March 31st, you can calculate what you need to pay and, and if what the exposure is. It doesn't matter if you're a social trader or not. With regard to the health surcharge, um, it's advisable. The total health surcharge is really $429, yes payable on a quarterly basis of 107.25. Why was I go to the board of general revenue all the time? So you can decide to in advance you pay the 429 and, and you have to go back for the rest of the year. It's up to you. Or you can pay it on a quarterly basis, 107.25. Yes, you can do that. Right? There's nothing wrong with doing that. But that's the health surcharge amount. So for a simple $429, don't get yourself um, caught out because attached to that is penalties and interest. So yes, for the constant back and forth, if you have to deal with the health surcharge, then yes, 429. Let me also indicate the Board of Inland Revenue is updating its systems. And I think very shortly, we'll be able to pay them online and do those kinds of things. Right now, you're getting work from the Board of Inland Revenue forms fulfilling and you can file your tax returns online. Um, for those of you who are not in that space of, 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 the, of the digital economy, you need to get into it eventually. And yes, shortly you'll find that Board of Inland Revenue will allow you to pay some of those payments online. Uh, not yet, but soon enough. Um, is there a penalty for paying health surcharge? Yes, there is, and we'll talk that later in this presentation. Uh, <laughs> there's a question put here, and I, <laughs> at least I have a sense of humor this morning. The question is this. 
is there a penalty for paying health surcharge? Example, if you did not know you had to pay it, the Board of Indian Revenue, the tax man, um, there's a way that the way we express this thing. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. So thanks to Fashion TT, we are here this morning to expose you to what your tax exposures are, and you will make sure that you do the right things so you are not ignorant of the law and you're not in a place where you're putting yourself at risk with regard to penalties and interest. You have to pay it because you, you, you have to pay the health charge. If you if you didn't know it, you, you need to pay it. Um, you're supposed to know it. It's there in the law. It's a requirement of, of a sole trader. If, on the other hand, you are employed with, let's say, Massey, as I was saying just now, and you have your sole trader business, Massey would take out your health charge for you on a monthly basis. You don't have to pay it twice. If you're otherwise employed and the employer is taking out health charge, you don't have to pay that because it will be taken out for you one time. All right, let's get on into emoluments now. What are emoluments? Because the tax form says you have emoluments, monies that you earn. Your salary is an emolument. Your wages, your bonus, your overtime remuneration, and all the other purposes that you have in terms of board fees, stipends, um, housing allowances, commissions, all those things are your emoluments. And therefore, in the tax form, the taxman wants to see all that you earn in this category. The question has been asked, and I want to stop and deal with this. If you register a business to secure the business name, but you have no activity, is there tax exposure? The question is, if you register a business, but you have no activity, is there tax exposure? Well, if you are not trading, um, you ought not to be paying taxes if you are not trading. So here's your challenge. Four years ago, I went to register with uh, register my, the name I so wanted. And I got the name registered. And I didn't go to the Board of Indian Revenue and register for tax purposes. Because what you ought to do, I go get my business registration done. I file with the, and get my business, my BR number. If it is, by, I am, I'm a sole trader or an individual. If I'm a sole trader, I'm not employed otherwise. I just registered my business, understand the background. I'm a sole trader. I just registered my business. I'm not employed elsewhere. Then I take those forms and I go and register with the Board of Inland Revenue to get my BR number. If I am not trading, then from point forward on an annual basis where the tax dates are, uh, you file what is called a nil return. Nil, submit your return, returns are in place. If, on the other hand, you, you decide, well, you know, I registered the business and I didn't go to the Board of Indian Revenue. When I registered, in, let's say, in 2017, and I come now to register, the Board of Indian Revenue will require, in addition to your registration documents, you will need to provide a letter of commitment that you were not trading during the previous years. Sign. If in future they find that you were trading and there are ways in which you can find that out, you can expose yourself to liabilities. So be careful how you operate. The ideal thing to do is that you, you are an entrepreneur, you are registered your business, you don't work anywhere else, Go and get your BR number, and on an annual basis, you didn't trade, file a nil return. File a nil return. And then when you start trading, just file a tax return with development information on it, and that's it. So that's what you do. You can secure the business same years, but remember to do that. What about vacation? Vacation also, I don't understand what vacation also means. If you're on vacation, I, then <laughs> once you register the business, Go register the business name with the Board of Indian Revenue and, and or your, yourself with the Board of Indian Revenue and file the investor returns. You need to file and say you're not making any money. You're not, by filing a nil return, nil returns mean in all the columns where you have to put a number, you put nil or zero, then that, that says you're not making any money. Yes, that says you're not making any money. The letter, if it is that you, 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 
I filed my business registration because I want to keep a name. I like the name John Wayne. And I filed that back in 2017. In fact, hold up. No, I filed it in 2014. 2014. Remember, let's link how the learning goes. I linked that, I filed in 2014. And somewhere in between, I do a little thing and I do a little thing and I didn't do a little thing. And you come now because of the government's pressure and you say, I want to register now. When you go to the Board of Inland Revenue, the Board of Inland Revenue will ask you to provide a letter that says, although you registered on in 2014, I was not trading and not doing business. I'm about to start the business now and I will now like to be registered. That letter, that letter they want on your file. Because if they prove to you later on that you were trading, then you have significant exposures on your hands. So that's why that letter is important why the Board of Indian Revenue will require it. How do you interpret the letter you receive from the government when the fine, when, when, when to, file, to, to file the return? How do you interpret the letter you receive from the government? Now, um, I will come to that as we do the tax return because I'm going to get into tax returns in a little bit. So bear with me on this one particular point and we deal with the monuments. Yes, because it, this deals with the monuments because the start of your income assessment, the start of how your income is assessed is based on your emoluments. Your sole trader, your business person employed, you're looking at the emoluments. Do you have a salary? Do you have wages? Do you have bonuses? So that you may have some of you maybe working elsewhere and you have to take into account the issue of how you make your money. Um, before I move on from this slide, the issue is whether or not if you are trading in between, what happens then, perhaps? <laughs> You're not trading in between. And, and please get this clear. Once you are, your business is registered, once you trade, once the first trade occurs, from that point forward, you're trading. There are times when you're not trading or you're not doing any business, but you, you traded before. It's a continuous process and there must be continuous assessment on an annual basis. Meaning, therefore, if you registered and you do a little bit of business and then for a year or two you didn't do anything, you still have to file returns and you still have to account for the income that you would have made. Pensions and interest can apply and we will talk about pensions and interest at a later time. Is vacation classified as emoluments? What, what type of vacation? Vacation pay. Vacation pay. If you're saying to me vacation pay, then vacation pay is really your wages and salaries that they pay in your advance. Right, because I'm going on vacation and they give you an advance payment to go on leave. That is also taxable. Of course it is. You're being paid in lieu of taking time for vacation. It is taxable. <laughs> it is still income. Yes, it is. Right? It is still income. So I'm paying. I am I was supposed to go on vacation and I didn't. And the board, in case of let's say the commissioner of police, a popular case recently, the commissioner of police before out of was he bought it, they believe was bought out. That is taxable, all right? What if you only had expenses and no business income? Ah, oh, very good question. If you had expenses and no business income, I want to hold on to those expenses and file the return saying that you made a loss. If, the question is put, if you made no income, if you made no income, um, what do we file? You do an income and expenditure statement. The income is zero, but your expenses of ten thousand dollars. The income is zero, but your expenses ten thousand dollars. You do your income statement, present it against your tax return, and create what is called losses. Why I want losses? Because in the case of a business, business losses can be written off against future profits. I want to repeat that. If I'm running a business, but I'm not making income, but I'm spending to get organized and put things in place, you account for the income. Your account for the expenditure. So the income is zero, but the expenses are what the expenses are. That means that you made a loss. In the case of businesses, not individuals, in the case of businesses, the losses incurred in a year can be carried forward against the profits of future years to reduce your tax exposure. Be mindful of that, please. 
income tax filing requirements. Let's get on with it. So we, we put all the income together. We understand what kind of organizations that we are running. And we're now saying, well, what are we going to do to file this thing? You know, So we want to file. Persons in receipt of emolument income only are not required to file a tax return. If you're in receipt of emolument income only. Now, what is emolument income? Salaries, bonuses, vacation, whatever have you. And why is that? Because the employer who paid you that income is responsible for taking out the proper taxes. The onus is on the employer to collect the correct taxes and pay that to the Board of Inland Revenue. So if you're getting a monument income, working for somebody, that's separate and apart. But once you are a sole trader, <laughs> once you're in business, you need to file a tax return annually. All other persons are required to submit an income tax return on or before April 30th. That was this week gone. <laughs> Don't panic, people. Don't panic. Don't panic. All persons who are required to submit an income tax return who are not getting a monument income, business people, sole traders, partnerships, corporations need to file their tax returns by April 30th in any calendar year. No, don't faint on me now. Don't faint on me now. Did you file your tax return? You're in business. <laughs> don't worry about it. We will sort it out. There are different things. A penalty of $100 is charged for every six months for which taxpayers fail to file such a return. And therefore, from November 1st this year, if you didn't file by April 30th, you will become liable for that hundred dollars <laughs> remember remember what i said guys we're going to show you the problem and then we're going to fix your problem for you you know do not panic life is a breeze you must enjoy this thing because once you understand and you have information you're king in the game you will know how to handle yourself you know, as you as the as we said look, uh, colloquially, you can handle your story as well. Don't worry about it. Information will give you that you have to answer stories. Somebody has their mic. Are they muted for me, please? I'm getting feedback. Income taxes outstanding on the day he or she was required to pay taxes attract a 20% interest on the first day of the following month of this date of payment. Somebody, somebody has a mic on. Could they just mute it for me, please? I'm getting feedback coming in. All right. So that income taxes need to be filed. Yeah. Income taxes. Somebody has a. Somebody has a mic on, and I don't know who. All right. Yes. What's happening here now? All right, we're back on. Cool. Great. All right. What we are saying is. All right, I'm um, yeah, paused. Right, thank you. Um, person in receipt of emolument income are not required to file income tax returns. All other persons are required to submit income tax returns on or before April 30th. Failure to do so is $100 for every after every six months from November 1st this year. Income tax outstanding. On payment date, you attract a 20% charge. All right. Income tax return that you have. I will get up, I will get to this form in more detail later this afternoon related to this afternoon. But basically, the income tax form looks similar to this. It's not a it might be daunting for some. There are two forms, as I said to you. You have the income tax form for the individual. This is the monument income. The first page is a data page with income minuses and whatever have you. 
that's why monument earners. So those persons who own salaries, wages, bonuses, and stuff like that, working for somebody, same format, they have to fill this out and their parts to be filled in. But when you come to non-emolument earners, people like yourselves who are in business, that first form on two sides, page one and two, is for emolument income. That first sheet is what I call the data sheet, and therefore that's the front of the, of the, of the filing. If I have a business in addition to my employment, or I don't have a business in addition to my, I, I don't have employment, but I have a business, that first page, that front of that first page must be filled out, and the back of it must be filled out in summary. But this form, which is part of the non monument section, is where you begin to put down your income and expenditure. I will show you this form in more detail later today, and we'll go through and talk about how we work it and how it, how, how it is that you can um, navigate this form quite easily. Um, but it's important for you to appreciate now that if it is that you are in business and you register your business and you are not trading, you're not employed otherwise, but you're not trading, file a nil return. Take up the form, fill out the relevant data information on the first page, and for all the numbers that you have, put zero up, leave it blank, and submit it. Sign, submit it, no more numbers in it, it says nil. So there's no income and they know that. The way the tax works, uh, revenue works, is that your payments go against a return. And once you have the return, that's how they will know that you dealt what you have to do. So that you have the income from the, from the monument income, therefore. So that is the first page, the first part of the page, this front page for your monument earners. But even if you are this form, this first part of the page must be filled out. If I'm working for the for, for Massey. I fill out this front page and the page and the one behind it, page two, and I'm done and sent my TD4 in. But I'm a designer and I'm working for Massey. So I'm filling out the same front page and then I'm going to the non monument section and fill out the relevant income issues and the other pages that I need to fill out as we go along. The very question that I answered a while ago, I want to make sure that you appreciate that. If you're not making income from your business, but you're spending money, please do the income and expenditure, zero income, lots of expenditure, and file a return that says that you made a loss. And it's from that loss that we go forward into the next year. And if you made a profit, you minus the profit against your loss and you reduce your tax exposure. Okay. Let's get into the language now of the, some of these taxes and what these taxes mean. We have dealt with the income tax and the monument income and those things. Um, tax or business levy is a levy on persons whose income exceeds $200,000 per year. It is a tax on persons whose income exceeds $200,000 per year. It is not therefore derived from a monument income. It's derived from business income. It is charged at a rate of 0 0.006 of a percent. Effectively, you are multiplying your total income by 0 0.006 of your gross sales or receipts and is payable on a quarterly basis. It is calculated on your gross sales or receipts and payable on a quarterly basis. Business levy are offset against individual income tax liabilities. In effect, a person is entitled to a tax credit against his business levy liability for a year of income. Of any payment made in respect of income tax liabilities for that year of income up to a maximum of the business levy. Now, you don't have to get into this and don't work out, don't try and study this hard and to go and pass no exam dealing with this. In the calculation of your taxes, the form that, that is there will show you how this works quite easily and then how it explains how to treat with this. So don't try, don't try and learn this hard at all. That's not for the exam. In the case of a partnership, any partner whose share of gross sales exceeds $200,000 would be liable to business levy. 
any partner whose sales exceeds two hundred thousand dollars will be liable to business levy. Who's uh, those persons exempt from business levy? Where a person's emolument income exceeds seventy five percent of his or her total income. If your emolument income exceeds seventy five percent of your total income, you're exempt. Where gross sales or receipts does not exceed two hundred thousand dollars, you're exempt. A person who has been in business for less than three years, meaning I do my business registration, and for the, those three years of operations or non-trading, you don't have to worry about business levy, period. What you have to concern yourself about is the next one that come in behind that, which is green fund levy. So there's business levy. We did have that with income tax, corporation tax, business levy. We need to concern ourselves with now green fund levy. This is a tax levied on partnerships and corporations that, going out that, you, that you have to deal with. Green fund levy is charged at a rate of 0.03 of a percent. Multiply your gross revenues by 0.003 and you will get the answer. Even if such income is exempt from business levy, even though you, uh, your income is exempt from business levy, you still have to pay a green fund. Bear that in mind. An individual who is not subject to green fund levy but a partnership is liable to green fund levy. Green fund levy is payable quarterly, like business levy. Business levy quarterly, income tax quarterly, when you're in business, and green fund levy quarterly payments. Corporation tax. Corporation tax, tax on the company's profits is derived if you may go elsewhere. And it doesn't really matter. Corporation, once you, you corporation earns money in the jurisdiction, there'll be tax exposure. Corporation tax is payable at a rate of 25% per annum and payable on a quarterly basis. So if you have a company, you ought to be um, paying taxes on some kind of quarterly basis. Corporation tax. The basis of assessment of profit and gains of the company over a 12 month period of any in any income year is how they derive their taxes so we're looking at 12 month periods depending on what the financial year and the company is all right let's go back for a minute to, to, to make sure that we all understand these things because you know we were talking and we talked about the levies and the taxes let me go back just to, to, to guide you here we had said before we had said before that you have your monument income, income earned from employment with somebody, but you all are in business on business people, then you have taxes on your business income. You have to file a tax return that encompasses as a sole trader, both your employment income and your business income in one tax return. Yes, yes, sorry. That's the point. Thank you very much for that one. I'll come back to that. The treasury, um, the so that we have the business levy. Um, yes, the threshold has been increased. Sorry about that. That's true. I had this. Is, I need to correct that. The threshold has been increased. I think it's out now about three sixty. That's correct. But, okay. All right. So the business levy is there. The green fund levy is there, and we need to be in a place where we are looking at how these taxes um are paid let's get to the corporation tax now so corporation tax is where we're at and we need to pay taxes quarterly on the income that the company has earned now one will argue that i don't know you know the three months have now passed and i don't have business records up to date and i don't know how much money i made should i still have to pay the taxes yes you do you do an estimate based on last year and you pay that. It's an estimate. You pay based on an estimate as to what you think your income is. You're doing the business levy calculation, you're doing the green fund levy calculation, and you don't have the records yet to say how much money I really made for the quarter. Then you estimate what it's supposed to be and you pay based on the estimate that you have. You have some exemptions for corporations, and we're getting into this in, in detail, but I, I, because it's a tax course, 
I, I have to give you some of this. Some of it you can ignore because it doesn't affect you all, but you will just go through the slide to make sure that you cover some of it. You have the distributions of, of XM Bank. You have the profits of investment companies. These things are exempt for tax purposes. Profits of approved sporting bodies, approved sporting bodies. Profits of registered corporate uh, uh, cooperative societies. So you see, from the point of view of tax exemption, cooperative societies must be registered in order to be exempt. Profits from a registered trade union, exempt. Profits from churches and charitable organizations, exempt. But you have to be registered. You can't just say that you're running and don't have your registration. Of course, residency, and it's important. A corporation is considered resident if it, it is managed and located in Trinidad. You as a sole trader, you're running and located in Trinidad. An individual is considered resident if when added he is, he would have spent at least six months in Trinidad. Once you have for more than six months, you are a resident. Your worldwide income is subject to tax. Your worldwide income. Non-resident persons are subject to withholding taxes. Yeah. Let's deal with the registration requirements. Um, if you are individual and you are you are employed by some organization, you should have a BIO number already. You should have a national insurance number you already employ. As a sole trader, therefore, you your that number that is your personal number is your business registration number. Once the business is registered by the Ministry of Legal Affairs and commence business activity, it must register with the Board of the Non Revenue. Must. The BR will sue you um, your numbers. There's the BR number if you are an individual or company, a business entity. That number doesn't change and must be quoted on any official correspondence to the BIR. That number is their number for life. The business company, the corporation must get a PAYE file number. If you're a sole trader and you're employing people, if you're a sole trader and employing people, you ought to have a PAYE file number. This number is to be used for remittances of deductions for income tax purposes and has to charge for individuals who are employed with you. So if you're a sole trader and you're saying to me, that you have three or four people that employ to you on a regular basis, sewing and doing whatever, you should have PAY registration numbers for them and paying their PAY. But registration, persons who have incomes exceed $500,000 per annum will need to qualify themselves for VAT purposes. Okay. I have a question. So let me jump too far, too fast. I just want to go back. Green fund levy. This is a tax levied on partnership or corporations. It is 0.3% and it is paid on that quarterly dates. An individual is not subject to green fund levy, but the partnership is. Partnership will be responsible. And green fund levy is payable on a quarterly basis. So let's get involved with the registration. And we're saying to you that you need to have your registration for your business. If it is that you're a sole trader, then your BR number is your personal BR number, and that's the number that's applicable to you for life. If you're a corporation, then you go get a BR number for the, co for the corporation. If you employ people, you need to get a BR a PAY file number. And if you meet the vast thresh threshold of $500,000 per annum, then you need to be registered so you need to get a BR number if you don't have one get one to get one take your business registration certificate if you're not employed elsewhere your id proof of address go we'll get it if you were registered some years ago and you were not trading but you're not going to get it then you need to take a letter along with, with that to explain to them why you weren't trading if you employ people get a PAY file number and if you meet the batch the VAT threshold then get but registered to get but registered 
you'll re be required to show the Board of Inland Revenue that you have met the vast threshold requirements by providing bank statements for at least six months. In some cases, they ask for 12. Whatever contract of service you're providing or contract that you have for service, copies of your registration documents, copies of ID of the directors if you're in a com company, copies of your ID if you're a sole trader, um, a sole trader, you need to have those documents presented to the Board of Inland Revenue at the Revenue Office in Port of Spain. Let's deal with the issue of business records. And I want to deal with this because if you don't have the records right, if you don't keep the records right, you will find yourself challenged in, in going down the road and doing this, this kind of work. So let's get the records right from the get go. Every person, every person who earns non emolument income is required to keep business records. Everybody. Once you are a sole trader and in business, you get non emolument income. Emolument income is salaries, wages, bonuses, etc. Not that. But if you're in business as a sole trader, you're a sole trader registered, you're getting a partnership, you're non emolument income. And therefore, you have to keep your records. Records must be kept at the registered, the registered address of the business. Records must be kept at the registered address of the business. Now, let me explain. Many of you are sole traders, and we'll talk about, we'll talk to you about this whole thing of your moving of address. So I go to the registrar, the registrar's office, and I register that I am Sally Jones trading as as, as Herbalife in in San Fernando. I move my location, and I'm now living in Curap. And they forget to go and change the business registration address at the registrar's office and the tax office. You need to do both, both locations, registered office and tax office. Change your address. Any change to your business registration must be notified to the Board of Inland Revenue and the company's registrar. And we'll talk about that in a little while. All records are to be kept and maintained in an English in the English language. No Spanish, no French, and no other language that you may choose to use. Once you're pulling out your hair and you can't figure out what to do, but keep it nicely ordered, keep it nicely put together, get your cash vouchers, your, your, your check payment vouchers, get a binder and put it in, please don't put it in a box. The more you put your work organized, the cheaper it is for you to get it done. Okay, the more you organize your work in order monthly, look my monthly bills, look my monthly invoices, look my bank statements in a file, one file, then hey, it's better for you, it's cheaper for you to do your work. Any and all records that support the calculation of, of the tax liability must be kept, any and all, any and all records that support your calculation of your tax payment must be kept. So then what are the minimum requirements of books that you should keep? You should keep, of course, from the Income Tax Act, a purchase day book, a sales day book, a record of expenditure, stock sheets, wages and salaries book, debtors and creditors ledgers, asset registers. You have computerized systems. You have computerized systems that you can use, that you can enter data into the computer and you have all these reports that you see here coming out at the push of a button. So you find yourself in a place where you don't want to um, to to um, you need to be organized. But it's in the simple. Every person um, needs to find themselves and engage in a business or profession must keep their records in English. Must have proper records being kept. Must have them ordered. Not in a box. Not in a piece of paper. Not in an envelope for me, please, because. When you take it to those persons who can do it for you professionally, it will cost you a lot more money because of the disorganization that you might be presenting to them. So you must keep the records to verify the information and the calculation of taxes, and you must keep those records for a good period of time. You remember what we said. Any person who fails to keep these records will find themselves liable in some way. So we want to avoid that. Record retention is where it's going to be next. But usually the records are going to be kept for at least seven years, i.e. the current year plus six prior years. And if you don't have it, if you don't have it, and the Board of Inland Revenue chooses to assess you, and you can't prove what you've done, 
the Board of Inland Revenue can easily assess and say for business such as yours, the tax payment is supposed to be Y, and you have no recourse because you have no evidence. You have to provide them with evidence. Keep financial records, keep your company registration documents, keep your employee records. An employee could come back to you many years after and ask you for information, and you should have those records on a permanent file, can you please? Do not employ people. Do not employ people or engage people without some degree of maintaining some records on them with regard to their business. Every person required by this section under the Income Tax Act must keep books and records and accounts shall retain every such record or book of accounts and every account or voucher necessary to verify the information. And any such record or books of account for a period of at least six years plus the one year. And they must have it to support the taxes and the tax returns that they have filed with the Board of Inland Revenue, please. So let's get on into the get on to the kind of accounting thing. This is where I think the fun is fun from the point of view that when you begin to understand what expenses are allowed or not allowed for tax purposes, you begin to realize how you manage your tax exposure. So pay attention. Let's see where you go. What makes an expense deductible, right? What makes an expense deductible for tax purposes? And we will do that. After we take a break, just for about 15 minutes, if you don't mind, it's now 10.32. Let's get back here somewhere around 10.47. And we will begin at that time with regard to the um, taxes and what expenses we want to consider. If you have any questions, please put them into the chat at this point in time. We will start back precisely at 10.47. 10 Look forward to seeing you. Let's enjoy this. Thank you very much. <laughs> 